Okay, so this is the second Vim training class, also known as the Joy of Painting with Bob Ross. And by Joy of Painting, I mean Vim. And by Bob Ross, I mean myself, Sean Biddle. So there's some things about Vim that are very different than your standard text editor, and that is the concept of modality, which means Vim has modes. So instead of just typing text and things appearing on the screen, you're in a different mode. So the I key, for example, won't always put an I in the file you're editing. Sometimes it will do something else. So Vim has a number of modes, and the first three that we're going to go over today are insert mode, normal mode, and command mode. And since this is the joy of painting, I'm going to use painting metaphors to explain these. So insert mode is a bit like having your brush on the canvas. You're editing the current painting to create things. The next one is normal mode. So your brush is off the canvas. You may be thinking about what you want to do or you're moving your brush around the canvas without changing it. Because you don't want to drag your brush across the canvas and paint all over the picture if you just want to move the brush. And the next one is command mode. Uh, this is a lot like mixing your palette or even creating a new canvas. So this is when you want to do things like drastically alter the document in ways that you couldn't do in insert mode or normal mode. Uh, any questions on those three things before we go on? Sweet. So the first thing is starting Vim, which you all have done. There are two main ways to do that. The first is uh, using Vim and then just targeting a file like any other Linux command. So you just do Vim example that whatever. Or you open Vim, and then you use the edit command, which is colon E, which is short for edit. And then you target a file, um, like expert.1, for example. But we're going to stay in the beginner mode. So th those are the two ways to, to open Vim. And then once you actually get into Vim, you'll notice that it is very different. If you start typing things, things will not happen the way you expect them to. Uh, for example, if I just tried to type my name, why didn't the S show up? Well, that's what we're about to learn. So there are a number of ways to get from opening the document to actually inserting text into the document as you would with a normal editor. And the first one that everyone learns is I, which is simply at my cursor, enter insert mode. For example, I'm here, I want to begin editing, so I will hit I. And depending on your uh, setup or Vim configuration, you sh should see in the bottom left, insert appear. If you don't, uh, we can cover that in the fourth week where we're going over Vim configurations. So that insert in the bottom left means that you're actually ready to start typing and what you type will be what you think you type. So now I can type my name and it's actually my name. The next one is very similar, but instead of inserting immediately where I am, for example, if I hit I here, it would just start inserting. However, if I do Shift I, it will go to the first non white space character. As you see there, if I start typing, it goes there. This is handy if you're moving around in a file like this, and there's something indented very far, and you want to edit it, but you don't want to move all the way over and edit it. So you just do Shift I, and it takes you to the first non white space character. The next one is S. Now S has a very esoteric usage that we'll, we'll find out how powerful it is later. But for now, suffice it to say that it deletes the character underneath your cursor and then puts you in insert mode like I would. So if I hit I here, it will put me between the E and the L, like so, 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 so. However, if I hit S, it's going to delete the L and put my cursor in that place, like that, like so. S is the introduction to this concept that you're going to have to throw away any mental map of characters between their shifted un and unshifted versions having anything to do with each other. So S does one thing, which is very uh, innocuous, which is just delete the character under the cursor and put me in insert mode. S is very much more destructive. 
So if I did S here, it deletes the entire line and puts me at insert mode at the beginning of the line. This is a very different action. So if you're ever editing in, editing in Vim and you hit S, unshifted, and it deletes the entire line, that's an immediate warning that you have caps lock on. <laughs> No. Uh, I, I will get to that, but uh, not till the end. So once you grasp that shifted and unshifted characters can be very different, uh, you'll, you'll have an easier time and not tear all your hair out. So A is very similar to lowercase s, except that instead of deleting the character under the cursor, it moves to the right of it. So you have I, which puts me between the E and the M, like so, so. And you have S, which deletes the character under the cursor and puts me in insert mode, like so. And you have A, which puts me between the N and the T and puts me in insert mode, like so. A is the next one. A is really useful, uh, but like S, it is very different than its unshifted counterpart. So Shift-A, all it does is put you in insert mode at the end of the line, like that. This is really useful if you're missing a semicolon, for example, and you're just going through the file, and you're like, oh, I missed a semicolon. There you go. Now, O and Shift-O are super useful, and they're one of the few uh, shifted and unshifted counterparts that actually share at least some semblance of tangential relativity to each other. So if I did O, I'm going to create a new line underneath my cursor and go into insert mode. If I do Shift O, it's going to do the same thing but on the line above, like so. Now this is, both of them are quite useful if you have something like an if statement. I can do if something, hit escape, then hit O, go like that, so on. Or just make my braces and then hit Shift-O, and it'll put me between them. There's a lot of uses for O. We'll get into that next class. Um, C has a bit like S, a slightly esoteric usage. So what it does is wherever my cursor is, it's going to delete from there to the end of the line, like that. A lot of these you won't use very often. But the goal of this is to throw them into your head and realize that they're there. So when you do come across a situation where they are useful, you go, oh, wait, I could have used C instead of doing I and then just holding delete for a long time. So any questions about the different keys you use to go into insert mode? Negatory? Awesome. C, as I, as I mentioned here, we'll, we'll go over next class because that, that is possibly the coolest thing about Vim. Yeah. Um, so we're in insert mode a lot there. I just showed you how to put your brush to the paper because when you open Vim, it was off the, off the page. So now to pick it back up, you just hit escape or control left bracket. So if I'm inserting text and I want to get back into normal mode because I just entered insert mode, I hit escape. Or, if you don't want to reach all the way over for escape, control left bracket, which keeps you on home row. And here's the big one. So here's why I told everyone to throw their mouses out. This is because I could do this. Do not ever do this. I could do this. You don't want to do this. This is bad. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just clicking randomly. When you have H, J, K, and L, as you can see here, J moves you down, K moves you up, and H and L move you left and right, respectively. These are the beginning of the concept of motions, which are keys that move you around a file. H, J, K, and L are the most basic possible, but they introduce you to the concept of an argument to a command. So for example, if I wanted to move down two lines, I would do 2J. It's actually going to move me down three lines. I'll explain why later. So I'm on the current line. I want to move down two lines to line 48. I would do 2J. 
Now, this doesn't seem like it would be that fast, but then you have to realize, if I know I'm on line 40 and I want to get to line 50, I do 10J and I'm on line 50. So, I, so I'm on line 40, I want to get onto line 50, which is 10 lines, so I say 10, so if I, set, if I show you this, if you look down on the bottom right, you can see 10, J. So it's going to execute the J command 10 times. I'll go into this a bit more later, but this is HJKNL, in addition to being the first motions, are the first introduction into taking an argument to a command. Next is why HJKNL instead of JKL semicolon because your hands rest on JKL and semicolon. Well, I'll, I'll get into that in the next class because that's some dim trivia that would be nifty to learn. Uh, so they invented the mouse. Why are you not supposed to use the mouse? Don't. Just don't. While you're learning, the mouse is your enemy, your mortal enemy. You will, in fact, not live through using your mouse. It will blow up. So we've covered a lot in 20 minutes. So are there any questions about these very large set of commands that I've, I've introduced you to? So we have how to get into insert mode, how to get out of insert mode, and how to move around. Any questions on any of that? All the commands that you've described so far as having the escape and control are executed in normal mode, right? Correct. Because that is, the, that is the mode you are in when you first open Vim. So already with this set of commands, you're already more powerful than Notepad or Notepad++ because you have power over what you're doing even before your pen hits the page. For example, if I'm editing and I want to delete the entire line, I could, if I'm in Notepad++, take my mouse, drag all the line, I can then hit backspace, do some stuff. Maybe I didn't select the right number of characters. Maybe I did. But in Vim, it's one character. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do that. And I know the, com the command to do so. This is what makes Vim more powerful than another editor. And we'll, we'll see better examples of this as we go, as we go on. So now, HJK now are the most basic motions you can possibly do. The slightly less basic are W, B, and E. And each have an uppercase counterpart, and each do something slightly different. Now, if I'm on this sentence here, and if I want to move to the word beginning, I can hit L until I get to the word beginning. And I can hit H to go backwards. But we have W, which is the word motion, which takes you forward to the beginning of the next word. So if I did W, 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 it'll move me between words. And likewise with HJKNL, if I do 3W, it will take me three words ahead. So if I do 3W, it takes me to beginning. So I'm on forward. I want to move three words over. This is the first word. This is the second word. This is the third word. So I do 3W. It moves me to beginning. Now. Shift W is the first introduction of the difference between a word and a quote-unquote word, which is this uppercase variant that you're going to see a lot in the Vim documentation. And the difference between a word, oh, a word and a word is the following. A word, as defined by lowercase w, is separated by anything that's not uh, a character. So if I had this is a string and did w it's going to move me between things that aren't uh, uh, words but if i did this here so if i do w here it's going to move me between the commas and the words themselves a shift w is a word as defined by characters separated by white space so this is a, a lowercase word, this is characters separated by non by non characters. A capital word is words separated by white space. So if I do shift W instead of W, it takes me 
to the next thing that is separated by white space. Obviously, if I do w here and I want to get the string, this is annoying. But if I want to get the string from here and I do shift w, it takes me right to it. Next is b, which is the same thing as w but backwards. So for example, I'm on b on the word beginning and I want to go backwards. If I hit b once, it's going to take me to the first character of next and so on and so on and so on. Now shift b is exactly the same. If I have this sentence here, this sentence here, and I'm on here, and I do uh, shift B, it's going to take me there. If I do lowercase b, it's going to take me there. So that, that's a fundamental thing that you sort of have to keep in your head. Uh, we get in the fourth class, we'll go over how to configure what defines a lowercase word and what defines an uppercase word. The next one is E, which is the, I worded this very carefully. So it's forward to the next end of word, not forward to the, the end of the next word. And this is why. If I'm in the middle of the word forward and I hit E, it's going to take me to the end of the word forward, not to the O. So that, that might get confusing. So if I wanted to get the, to the end of the word beginning, you would think it would be 3E. But instead, it's 4E because the D is in between, and that is also an end of word. Shifty is the, is the same thing. So any questions on W, B, and E before I move on? I yes? You can prefix any command with like a number to repeat the command x amount of times? Almost everyone. Almost everyone. Um, so like HJKNL, you can prefix W with, for example, 3W or 4E. Uh, and then that'll do the same thing. Anything else? Right. So the HJKNL and WB and E were the first introduction to having a number before the command. Now F and T are going to be the introduction of the full syntax that we're going to go over in depth in the next class. So if anyone is familiar with Becca's Snower form, it sort of looks like this. So you, anything in square brackets stuff is optional. Anything in angle brackets stuff is required. So F, for example, moves me forward until the nth O. So we have number, which prefixes the verb F in this case. And then we have a noun, which is the argument to the verb. So for example, if I wanted to move to the first E, and I'm on the A, I would do FE, right? If I want to move to the second E, I would do 2FE. So there are, there are, in fact, two arguments to this one verb. The first prefixes the verb, which is the number of times you want to execute the command. And the noun is the suffix to the verb, which is your actual target. So you have a count, a verb, and a noun, and this is critical to understanding how Vim's commands work. So firstly, as I've said, F moves you forward until the nth O. So FE, 2FE, 3FE, etc. Now, unlike W and B, which are two keys that move you forward and backward, F and Shift F are the same key that move you forward and backward. So if I'm here, and I move to the previous E, I do capital F, E, and that'll move me backwards. Likewise, if I do 2F, E, or 3F, E, I'll do 2F, E, for example, 2, Shift, F, E, it'll move me backwards to the second E. So this is really helpful if you're something like, you're on this line, and you want to go into the set of parentheses that has the word inc inclusive in it. So you know it's the third left parentheses, so you go 3, F, left parentheses, and then you move to that parentheses. Now you could do www, 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 until you got there, but that is not the most efficient movement, and Vim is all about efficient movements. So as noted here in the parentheses, F is inclusive, which means, as we can see here, my cursor is on B. If I did FG 
to get to the first G, you'll notice my cursor is on G. T is the same as F, but it's exclusive, meaning until that character. So FG will put my cursor on the G. TG will put my cursor before the G. So if you want to think of it as a mnemonic, you have forward until, or you have forward to and then forward until. So you have forward to and then you have forward unto or until with G with T. So any questions on those two or the generic uh, count verb noun syntax? Did you just cover the exclusive part? Or what was mm -hmm. the so in the difference between what? Oh. Yeah. So the difference between inclusive, inclusive and exclusive, just to recap, ah, is F will move my cursor onto the character. FG will put my cursor on G. TG is exclusive which does not include, which, which is to say excludes the character I'm searching for. So if I do TG, it will move me until that G, but not including that G. Anything else? OK. So we've still covered a lot of ground. So hopefully your brains aren't dead yet. And then this brings us to some of the most powerful features of Vim, which are searching. So now almost every text editor has searching but almost all of them have like some weird key combination like control F or control R and then you have to click a checkbox to select if you want to search forward in the document or backward in the document or something like that. All you have to do in Vim is while you're in normal mode hit forward slash and you'll get your cursor will move down to the bottom of the screen you'll see a forward slash and a blinking cursor. Now this is where you type the thing you want to search for. Now for example if I just want to search for the word forward, I can just start typing F-O-R-W. And it's going to go from the top of the document to the next instance of the word forward. And to move between them, you do N and Shift N. N will move you to the next result of your search. Shift N will move you backward to the previous result. So for example, if I hit N, it will take me to the next word forward and so on, 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 etc. Now if I do Shift N, it's going to move me backward, like so. Now, if you just want to search backward from the start, you would use a question mark. Now, I don't really recommend this because N and Shift N, in this case, flip. And that's, that's kind of hard to keep in your head. So if I did slash forward, oh, not forward, forward, it's going to look for that, and I do N. If I instead did uh, question mark forward and then hit N, it's going to move me backwards, which is kind of counterintuitive. I mean, it makes sense, but the reason I don't recommend it is because it's kind of hard to keep in your head because you'll hit N, and then you'll go in the opposite direction you expect. Um, so really, I recommend forward slash for most of your searching. And there's a setting I will show you in week four that will show you that will wrap around. For example, I have this set in my configuration. So if I did forward and then just keep hitting N until I got to the last one, you'll notice that it'll wrap back around to the top. So I go to line 85 and then it'll jump me back down to 64. This is not on by default. So by default, if you keep hitting N, you'll get to the last result and you'll stop. But as I said in week four, I'll show you how to make this wrap around. How do you cancel this out then? Like how do you turn off the highlight for even need that anymore? Uh, there's actually a command called no highlight, which is short for no HL. Um, it's that right there. But uh, sure yeah, it, is. Um, it, it does get kind of annoying. So I guess I can, as sort of a moving ahead and getting ahead of myself, that's how you cancel the highlight. So if I did forward, I have mine so it doesn't highlight, but yours, I think by default it does highlight. So if you just want to turn it off, it's just no HL. Um, so those, that's those two. And I'll get into more details next week, but search supports full regular expressions. Um, but I don't want to get into that now because there's a whole other argument uh, or a whole other subject inside of Vim's regular expressions to get into. So we have forward and backward, and then we have star, which is actually ranked on Vim's website as the most world-changing key in all of Vim when people find out about it. And that is, you're editing, you're in normal mode, 
and you want to search for example the variable that you're on right now so if you just hit star it's going to search for that and then you can then you can hit n and shift n to to move you between those results just as if you did forward like that what's that right and then g star is the same thing but unbounded and I'll, I'm going to skip over that for a second until I go over uh, pound. So pound is the same thing as star, but backward. So just like we have forward slash and uh, question mark, we have star and pound. So that'll take me forward, and then pound will take me backward, like so. And I've already gone over n and shift n. So now there's this concept of bounded and unbounded. And this is very much, if you're familiar with regular expressions, as uh, word boundaries. So now, if I have the word forward, I just do for, right? And I want to search for the word for, and I do star, it's only going to look for the word in its entirety for. This is a bounded search. Now, in contrary, if I just wanted to search for the three characters, F-O-R, and didn't care if it was the entire word or not, I would do G star, which is an unbounded search, and you'll notice that it found F-O-R, and it was part of another word. And this will continue on. And you'll notice here it found it in between, or in the center of another word. So that is the difference between bounded and unbounded. And the, the differentiation is incredibly powerful. For example, if you have a variable that if you have some test variable, and you have another variable called test, and then you just want to search for test, there's only two occurrences. But if I do G star, it'll find that one, and then it'll find this one as well. So any questions on those? Because those are super powerful, and they confuse quite a few people. So I think I just played with it a little bit. And, but star selects the entire word. Like it doesn't matter if I'm in the middle of the word. Correct. Um, star will select the entire word even if you're in the middle of a word. And also, for uh, the search slash, I never use N and capital N. I always just hit slash slash enter. And that brings me to the next thing. Uh, yes, there's a reason why that does that. But it is the, the reason why that does that is actually super complicated. And I'm going to cover that next week okay. because it is a really, really useful feature. Yeah, so for now, to move between them, I would recommend N and Shift N, because okay. just because they're, they're more efficient methods to do so. Yeah, it's a single button. Yeah. Okay. Question? Yes. Uh, case insensitive search? Uh, I believe I actually... That might be a setting. I forget. Uh, actually, I have the help files right here, because this is super awesome. Help star. Uh, let's see if we can find... Yeah, there's ignore case, um, uh, which is just a setting that w you would set. So you do something like set ignore case, and then you would search for it, and then it would be case insensitive. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you noticed, I would search for the word forward, and it also picked up capital F forward. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't like this, because if you're familiar with Linux at or Unix environments at all, case sensitivity matters all the time. Um, so I don't like... Uh, 99.9% .9 of the time searching case insensitively. I was just thinking about that. The yeah. Content yeah. Programs. However, with uh, forward slash, there's a much easier way to do that. So if you're doing forward slash and you want to search for the word forward, you can search that here, but it'll only find lowercase f. If I want to search, oh, I have said ignore case, ignore case. Turn that off. Um, search for forward, it's only going to find lowercase forward. If you want to do it just for this current search, you do slash c. And that says case insensitively. And you can just type forward here, and that'll find it case insensitively. There are other switches besides uh, backslash C, but I'll cover that next week. Any other questions about uh, searching? Sweet. So now is copy and paste. And I'm going to add another one here, which is undoing your changes. You undo stuff, right? Um, and right. so, firstly, is yank and paste. Now, this is one of the first 
commands that we've run into that is a verb that accepts a noun that is not a single character. Now, yank accepts a noun, but that noun is a motion. For example, instead of doing of YW yanking the character W, it will yank the word. So if I did YW here and then hit P, it will paste the word example. Likewise, if I did, um, let's say, uh, two YW, it'll copy two words, um, which is, in this case, just the, the, uh, the colon. But if you remember... Could you buy two W? Uh, I think that'll work as well. Sorry, if you start at the Syntax, beginning of a word. I think that makes more sense. To me. Um, yeah, it, it might make more sense. It's just um, generally you want to keep the the count, verb, noun, syntax pretty similar. Um, but if you remember, there's shift W. So if I wanted to copy um, all the way to here, I can do uh, two Y shift W, and then I've pasted that block. And then, so the difference between P and Shift P is if I do P here, I've pasted it after the E. If I do P here, I've pasted it before the E, right? Hmm. Now, I think this is a bit more advanced than I care to get into, but I'll add this one, which is visual selection. So if you hit V, this actually introduces a new mode. And you'll notice in the bottom left that it says visual. Now, if I move around in this mode, you'll notice that it's highlighting things. There are, there's a lot of stuff you can do in this mode, but for now, we'll just go over yank. So here, if I do a visual selection here and then hit Y, it's going to yank everything in my visual selection. This is a lot like using your mouse to select text. So if I just do there and then Shift P, you'll notice that's what it pasted. Is so there any questions about Y and P? The, the, the YW, when you do a 2Y lowercase w, yeah. that'll do, I wasn't getting, I was only getting one word. Or only well, you'll get the colon included. Okay. I yeah. See, I so th this goes back to the concept of a when word. The word versus the word. Yeah. Okay. A word versus a word. So if I did 2Y shift w, I get that okay. because that's separated by a space. If I do 2YW, uh, I only get the colon because the colon itself is actually another lowercase word. Gotcha. Right. Now, how do you do the selection part? Mm -hmm. Right. So if I, uh, V, you'll notice in the bottom left, it'll say visual. And then you can do any motion you want, and it'll move you around, and it'll highlight things. Now, this is uh, sort of the, the quick and dirty way to select some arbitrary text. Like, it would be very hard for me if I wanted to select from here to here without using visual selection or my mouse. Um, so this is, this is the way to, to select across arbitrary lengths of text. So if I did Y here and then pasted it here, you notice it looks kind of weird because I pasted it in here. So let's make a new line. And that's what I pasted. Nice. Also, hence that you have to use the JKL for that, not the arrow keys. Yes. You have to do, your hand to your mouse. Yes. I was actually going to ask about visual mode because yeah. So any questions about those those four keys? They they are very more complex than what I'm presenting right now, but uh, I will get into that next class because they are super powerful and some of the most powerful keys that you'll use. Um, uh, I have a kind of question. Yes. So I noticed that if I hit yank in the middle of the word, mm -hmm. it only copies to the end of the word. Yes. Lowercase word. Um, but you can also do yank yank or yy and that will copy the whole line. Yes. Okay. So if you did what? If you were in the middle of a word when you hit w, it moves to the end of that word. Right. Yeah. So th there is a way to actually yank the word while you're in the middle of it, but I'm not going to tell you till the next week. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have yank yank, so I'm cool. So how, as you mentioned, if you simply do yy, that will yank the line you're on. So if I do yy and p, it'll just copy the line. If I You'll notice if I keep hitting P, you'll just keep pasting the thing that I copied. You can do like 10, 10 P and or yes. Or I could do could I do like 10 Y Y and I'll copy like a block of code. Or if you, and then P? Yeah. So Y is is just like all of the other commands, 
So it'll copy, it'll take a number argument. So if I do 2yy, it'll copy three lines. As I mentioned earlier, if I want to move two lines down, I do 2j, which, which will actually move me three lines. So I move three lines in this. It doesn't happen. Right. So if I do 2yy, it's going to copy three lines. If I do shift p, oh, oh actually, uh, 2yy. Oh, so yy, when you do 2yy, actually takes the current line into account. Okay. Unlike every other command in Vim. Okay. So be careful with that. Uh, so if I do 3yy and then paste it here, it'll pay, copy three lines. Alternatively, you could do b, select the three lines, move to the end of the line, or end of the, uh, yeah, the end of the line, copy those, and then shift p as well. Yes. Uh, so any questions on that? Don't get yy. What do you mean don't get yy? It doesn't. It copies. Oh, well, it's, it copies. Think of yy as its own command separate from y. And it takes its own number of arguments. Okay. Now I understand. Yeah. So that's actually a really good point. So if you think of yy as its own standalone command, which is completely disparate of y, you get, you get in the correct mindset because there's a large number of scenarios where you'll see something like star and g star or j and gj now this is a better example because j and gj do unbelievably different things even though they they have the same letters in them so it, it's it's hard to wrap your head around it but you have to throw away the idea that letters are related to each other and just sort of have to keep a lot of space in your brain for what each letter does You'll eventually forget where your car keys are, but you'll be faster in your editor. That's fine. You need to start. What does G do by itself? G doesn't really do anything by itself. Okay. It's kind of, we ran out of... Prefix? Well, you can think of it as we ran out of keys on the keyboard, so we're going to do things. That's not the real reasoning, but it's, it's just helpful to think of it that way. Because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can't, really, you can't really shift star and get anything meaningful because it's already shifted, right? Uh, I'm going to get into that actually. How about, how can I like control A? Like not control A. Well, like select all, what, select all, what, yeah. Um, so if you want to select all, um, I'm, I, I have some extra time, which is the only reason I'm going to cover this. Okay. So um, I'm going to introduce you to two motions. So we're familiar with W, B, and E, right? There is another one which is gg, lowercase g, lowercase g, and that will take you to the t top of the file. It'll take you to the zeroth character of the file. Its, its complement is shift g once, and it'll take you to the end of the file. Okay? So now we have this set of keys to take us to the top of the file and the end of the file, and we know how to do uh, select things visually. So anyone take, want to take a wild guess at how you would do the equivalent of a control A in Vim? B, G, G, B, shift G. No, nope. close. I th think about your entry point when you start the selection. No, nope, not yet. G, G, B, uh, then just the shift G. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so G, G, well you had, you had them slightly back here. You had uh, B, G, G, shift G. Yeah, there you go. So you do GG V Shift G. That selects the entire file. Glorious. Now there's there's actually there's visual mode. There's two other modes that have the word visual in them that I'm gonna go over next week, which answers my questions, Mike's question about can you select multiple lines at a time? And the most powerful, in my opinion, is is block selection. And, and a lot of people don't even know what that would mean. Which I've seen you do. Yes. Um, you no. Copy columns. You can copy columns. And it's, it's a very strange thing when you go into that it's mode. But I'll show you something of what you can do with it. I won't show you how to do it. If you can see my keyboard, you'll, you might be able to get a glimpse of what I'm doing. I'll do this. What? 
Or alternatively, so th that's the concept of block selection. Oh, goodness. Can so you increment I'll, the thing that you're putting in the block selection? Um, yes. So that's actually that's such a great question because it shows off the emergent property of Vim. So if I did this. Um, Let's say I had a, an array with right. indexes starting at zero, and I want to change all the indexes in my line of array assignments. That's that's um, it's a bit more complicated, okay. but I will sh I will show you how to do it. So if I had one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm in screen, so this might get a little bit weird. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if yeah uh, screen is I think consuming. The character, oh, yeah. That's okay. I uh, but there okay. there is a way to increment a number like that. Um, um, but and there there are ways to increment those as a whole. But uh, I think screen is consuming my okay. my characters. I know it's possible. Right. So th this is just sort of a glimpse into. The emergent properties of Vim. So we learned GG, right? We learned Shift G, and they seem relatively banal, re relatively innocuous commands. But when you combine that with something like V, you suddenly get a very powerful function, which is select everything on the page, right? So GG, uh, V, Shift G. And this is something that you just cannot get in another editor, which is an emergent. Uh, system like uh, the great point that Grant brought up is if I was inserting text and I did Sean could I for some crazy reason actually pass a number argument to I like if I did three I and type Sean then exit insert mode would it type my name three times why yes it would um, so once you realize that everything you do in Vim for the most part, follows this count, noun, or verb, noun relationship, you unlock a wealth of potential while you're editing. Which is bring me, brings me to the first class wherein I said, 90% of the time, you're not a programmer. You're an editor that edits programs. So most of the time when you're working, you're not doing, you might be doing this. So you open a file, and then there's a bunch of code that you're scrolling through. Right. Very infrequently are you in insert mode the entire time, writing entire classes, doing stuff, and never leaving. You never have your pen on the page the entire time. If you're if you're writing a book, you're going to take your pen off the page at some point because you want to think about what you're looking at. You want to add context to your editing. That's why Vim is so much more efficient with even a simple command like W versus holding the right arrow key or the left arrow key or holding down, for example. So now we've gone to the end of the, the, the second class wherein I give you your homework. Yes. homework? Okay? I do have for, question for, right? Yeah, questions, questions before homework. Going back to like moving around with the, the, the keys and right. WBE, yes. is there one that just takes you to the end of the line and the beginning of the line? Yes, those are basic enough that I can, I can sort of show you um, those ones. Let me undo all the changes I've done here. So I'll add these to the basic motions, so WW. Let me find that. Nope. So there is zero, which takes you to the zeroth character of a line. So if I did zero here, it would take me to the very beginning of the line move to the zeroth character of the line. And then if you're familiar with regular expressions, you'll you'll notice this as the dollar sign anchor, which will move you to the last character of the line. So if I was here and I just did dollar sign, it's going to move me to the last character of the line. Now there's a third one, which 
Anyone remember what shift I does differently than I? Correct. So zero will take me to the zeroth character, which is to say the very beginning of the line. Caret will take me to the first non-blank character of the line. So if I did zero, I move there. If I did caret, I move there, right? So you have a set of motions. Is there zero again? Zero. See, I'm not moving to the tab. Or actually, it's moving to the end of the tab in my editor. Interesting. Yeah, that might be a setting, but we can we can go over that in more detail. Yeah. So everyone ready for homework? Any more questions about anything I've gone over to so far? Okay. Now I want you to, to close this file. If you have changes, I'll show you how to close it. If you do Q, you might get an error. So if you do Q bang, that'll get out of the file. Well, WQ will also write. Actually, I'm surprised that why I didn't go over that is beyond me. So I'll go over that first. So I'm going to start a new, a new instance of Vim. This is some stuff. So the way you save a file is with colon W, right? But I'm in a new file, so it's going to give me an error because it didn't have a file name. So I'm going to do colon W, file name. So this is a good intro to the command mode. So any to, if you're in, in, in insert mode, so we have the three modes. We have insert, normal, and command. When I first open Vim, I'm in normal mode. If I want to go into command mode from normal mode, so let's set up a, a sort of matrix. So if I want to go from insert to normal, I simply hit escape or control left, uh, left bracket, right? If I want to go from insert to command mode, let's go here, command, I just hit escape first. So I would do the insert to normal, right? And then colon. So that will take you into command mode. So I'm in normal mode, I just hit colon, I'm in command mode. Your cursor, much like with the search, will jump to the bottom left of the screen, then you'll be able to type stuff. The first command we'll, we'll learn is W, which just writes the file. And then let's go with the other ones. So we have uh, normal to command mode, and that is just colon, right? And we have normal to insert mode, which is that big long list of I, shift I, S, shift S, C, shift C, O, shift O, etc. And then if you're in command mode and you want to go into normal mode, you just uh, hit enter. So for example, I'm in normal mode, I go into command mode, I just hit enter, and I'm back in normal mode. Simple as that. So W to save the file, Q to quit the file, and you can combine these operations by doing WQ, which is going to write and quit the file. Now, I'll, as uh, I mentioned earlier, if you don't have a file name, you'll get an, a, a big warning saying that you can't save a file with no name. Likewise, if you've edited the file and then you try to quit Vim with Shift Q, it's going to give you an error saying that you have, you have no write since last change, no save since your last change. If you really want to quit, as the uh, error suggests, you add a bang to override. So if I really wanted to quit the file, I could do this. That would throw away any changes I have and just quit the file. However, I want to save the changes, so I'm going to do WQ. That's going to write and exit out of Vim. So any questions about command mode, insert mode, normal mode, writing the file or quitting the file? I'm really surprised I forgot to put that in the beginner document. I will amend that document at the, uh, at the end of this. So are you guys ready for your homework? Yes. OK. So possibly you've edited your VimRC. Possibly you don't know what your VimRC is. So your VimRC is the configuration file that holds all of your settings in Vim. So the location of this file is home slash dot vimrc. This file may or may not exist. If it doesn't, simply open it. I'm going to have a lot of stuff in it. And I want you to put these lines in it. Okay?
Everyone ready? Uh, for GVim, it's slightly different. Um, you're going to do this. Um, while you're inside Vim, do in normal mode, you're going to go into command mode with colon. You're going to do E, right? And then you're going to do home, uh, then hit tab. That'll expand to like my documents or whatever it is. Oh, okay. Um, alternatively, uh, I'm going to, if you. Use your mouse. I'm, I'm going to let you use your mouse because you're in, in GVim. Uh, if you go to the toolbar and you go to edit, there will be a selection in there that says edit my startup settings. Gotcha. If you open that, that will open up your VimRC. Oh, okay. You see that in there? Yeah. Okay. So this is your homework. I'm not going to let you use the arrow keys. They will, so in normal mode, they will no longer do anything. Um, so once you've write, written this, I'm going to give you four more to, to write. And it's essentially the same, except that it's I know and then the same commands. So I have a function set. Do I write it after that function line? Uh, or anywhere in this thing? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Just uh, add some new lines to the bottom of the file. Ooh, right. So, so I, I want your homework is to have these four lines or these eight lines, sorry, in your VimRC. So what this means is I'm in normal mode right now. My arrow keys won't do anything. They'll simply not work. Likewise, if I go into insert mode, they won't work either. So a lot of people, when they go in, they, they start learning Vim, they're editing some stuff in normal in insert mode, so I'm doing some stuff is awesome. And I'm gonna go down here and more stuff. And they'll still be in insert mode, and they'll try to use their arrow keys to move around, which is a big no-no. Insert mode is for inserting text. It's not for moving around in the document. So the correct way to do it is to exit insert mode and then move around. You don't move around a, a, a painting with your brush stuck to the canvas. That's just the wrong way to do it. Yes. You could also add like a set if you want and then the little numbers will right. on the side. That's going to come up in week four. Okay. Um, so week four is going to explain this is week two. Is going to explain everything I have in my VimRC, while I why I have a bunch of stuff that looks like this. It's going to cover how to completely customize, how to edit your VimRC, how to uh, make your own functions, how to do your own mappings. Yes. Um, and if we have time, it'll possibly go over creating your own color scheme. Because people like having their own color schemes. Most people I know that edit in Vim have, if not created their entire own color scheme, have at least edited someone else's. So we'll cover that briefly. Um, so that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Can you go back to the, uh, where we're just adding the down, left, right, and up? Yes. Up? So I'll show you here. Dot Vim, startup, mappings. Oh, no, no, no. Ignore that. That is, that is, that is week three's homework assignment. Um, so you just want this right now. Yeah, so you have no, down, nop, which is no operation. Um, and then I know. So what this is saying is remap in normal mode, down, left, up, and right. And in insert mode, remap down, left, up, and right. Did you open, close and open up him? Yeah, and I killed the terminal and opened the new terminal. Nope. Okay. 
How many words per minute can you guys type? Um, yeah, mine was about 110, 120. Oh, you did not edit your grammar sheet. I thought I did. Completely empty. How is it in there? I just wrote it. Did you save it? Mm -hmm. So, any other questions before we conclude this first class? Uh, just oh, up. I just did yeah, a yeah. verb, visual shift, <laughs> visual yank, uh, pasting, and then everything. Yeah. You can actually find these. this file in particular. It's going to look different. It's going to look like this. But you'll be able to find it at this URL. It should be colon slash slash github.com slash sean c plus slash dot files. So that has all of my Vim configs. I would appreciate it if you didn't peek at them so far, um, because, and certainly don't use my VimRC yet, because it will completely destroy your Vim. <laughs> At the very least, can we take color and syntax highlighting right now? Uh, I would suggest instead you go to this website. Um, you go to Byte fluent dot com slash vivify go to this website and then that will let you preview a bunch of vim color schemes and download the file appropriately and then uh, you can go to uh, either vim.org and it'll, it'll show you how to install that but uh, uh, yeah that's that after I save this, do I have to restart something? Or is it like the next time I open it up? The next time you open it up, it will have those settings. There is a way to do it without restarting Vim, but That's okay. week three. <laughs> Everything is the next week or week three. Um, so the homework is to just get using the using Vim in general without yeah. using the up and down arrow. No, this is cool, Sean. Yeah, a week, a week will be... Uh, the first two days will be monstrously frustrating. You will hate me with the passion of a thousand suns. Um, because most people, when they're editing in Notepad++ or Eclipse or any other editor that's not Vim, they're editing and they're, they're used to hitting up and left and right because they're not modal editors. And they'll, they'll, you'll hit up and down and left and right so many times in insert mode that you'll, you'll, you'll probably break your keyboard because you'll get so angry because you're just like, God damn it, escape. And then you'll go into um, normal mode and be like, son of a bitch, it's still not mapped. Then you're going to go HJKL and be like, oh, look at that. My, my, key, my hands are still on home row like they're supposed to be. And then you'll, you'll get into this concept of your hands never leaving home row. They won't leave for moving around. They won't leave for selecting text because you don't need your mouse anymore. They won't leave for saving. They won't leave for opening. Your keyboard is your friend. Um, and moving as little as possible, being as lazy and efficient as possible, is the heart of uh, editing in Vim. So I, I think without any further questions, I think we're, we're pretty much done with week one. Yay. Hooray. I'm going to stop recording now.